Hey, welcome back, rescue fans. It's Roy Shaw with Roy and Rescue. It has been a while, but you know, if you don't have anything really that interesting to talk about, my opinion is you wait until there is something interesting to talk about, and there is definitely something interesting to talk about, and it's probably affecting all of you. So if you wanna know more about what my stance is on COVID-19, stay tuned. Coming right up. Months ago, this huge thing called COVID-19 hits the scene. I was very tempted to come out and talk about it. However, upon early research, I knew that this was going to be an evolving situation and pretty much most of what we knew was how much we didn't know. And there's still a lot we don't know. And chances are you're very concerned about this virus. Where did it come from? Why is it killing so many people? When is it going to end? But I think instead of just talking about the same things that I t that everybody else is talking about, instead of sensationalizing this virus beyond what maybe it deserves as a sudden acute respiratory distress syndrome or SARS type of virus, um, I think it's more important to talk about how does it relate to rescue? Some of you are just simply thinking about what do I do if I need to provide CPR to someone who potentially has COVID-19? Am I at risk? Will I catch this virus if I give CPR? If I wanna protect myself against COVID-19 and provide CPR, what's the best way to do it? And that's a valid question. However, the answer may not be what you wanna hear. You know, what, what I'm imagining now about COVID-19, especially given its transmittability, is that there's probably a high chance that COVID-19 is an aerosolized versus nebulized type of, of communication, meaning the particulate hangs in the air for a long time, thereby making it highly more transmittable than if it was in droplets and fell to the ground right away. Even if it's not aerosolized, it's obviously highly contagious. If you're a professional rescuer and you wanna give respiratory assistance or rescue breathing or um, CPR, there's really only one really good way to do that and minimize your chance of infection. And that's by getting PPE that may not be available to you. If personal protective equipment in the form of a full Tyvek eye shield, completely sealed, um, with a, at least an N95 filtration mask, if not a P100 level face mask, that obviously tells you you need to have a bag valve mask with oxygen supplementation, full gloves. You're going to have to isolate as if you're in a hazmat environment and you would only be able to give resuscitation by means of uh, ventilation assist adjuncts and full ability to decontaminate without cross-contamination for you to make it in and out of that type of rescue situation and minimize your risk and contracting the disease itself. Well, that's that's the healthcare professional level. What about for the lay rescuer? What about for the family member? What about for the neighbor who is called in an emergency? Uh, you're an off-duty nurse, doctor, clinician of some sort, and your neighbors know it, and they're trying to um, they're trying to get well from the the virus on their own at home, which is totally valid and the loved one goes into respiratory distress and or respiratory failure. Am I able to rescue in that environment with basic CPR shield and gloves and not contract the virus? And my professional, my infectious disease and transmittability experience is the answer to that is no you have a very, very, very good chance of being exposed to the virus, contracting the virus, and then suffering the symptoms of having that virus in your body. Chances are you're not walking around with supplemental oxygen and a bag valve mask with a full Tyvek suit and full eyewear and full N95 or P100 mask 
uh, and gloves and booties, uh, chances are you're not walking around that way. Chances are you're walking around at best with a CPR shield. And if it's your family member, spouse, uh, child, grandparent, you're probably going to be put into the same situation that every loved one is when there is a crisis and your health and well-being could be compromised in order to help them. I think the best thing for you to do is to think about that before it happens. What am I willing to risk if my loved one needs me and they're infected with COVID-19? Maybe you have a grandparent or a parent living with you. I think that parents living with kids, grandparents, uh, immunocompromised family members, family members with um, already pre-existing conditions, that there's a, a really healthy conversation that could be had where the whole family decides what is our plan of action. Do we full blown take the risk, rescue at any cost, and deal with the consequences? Which may or may not actually mean that you're gonna contract the disease and have serious signs and symptoms. You might not. Everybody reacts seemingly different to this virus. Um, but you could. And it's just a conversation that I think is worth having. Should we have a plan, pre-talk about it, uh, and then honor and respect the, 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 the family member's decision? It could be a grandparent that says, look, I'm 88 years old. If I get this disease and I die from it, I do not want you, my son, my daughter, to come in and expose yourself if I'm self-quarantining at home and risk your own well-being. I'm at peace. I'm ready to die. Do not risk your well-being and the well-being of your family by coming in and trying to do CPR on me. I don't want it. And then have the respect and the, and the due diligence, I guess, to make that decision in your head that, that this was thought out and I'm at peace with it as best you can. It doesn't mean it's not gonna be sad. It doesn't mean that there isn't gonna be loss. It doesn't mean that there isn't gonna be this feeling of, why did this have to happen? But that's aside from everything. You, by, by pre-talking about it, by pre-planning this, you're not caught unaware or ill-prepared. You will have had an opportunity to talk about it, to think about it, even spouses might have to say, we are going to choose not to intervene because we've made a decision that one of us has to survive to take care of the children. Now that's, that's, this, is, this is unprecedented. Um, these, are, these are difficult, difficult decisions and there are no easy answers. So Roy, what would you do to be able to help somebody uh, and not get the disease. This side of full isolation PPE and proper ability to decontaminate prior to doffing my PPE, I'm afraid that, that this, this is a situation where if you choose to do basic CPR and first aid, you're basically saying to yourself, and I'm willing to face the effects. If you're a healthcare professional and you actually have all that PPE and you can do it safely, well, then you could probably do it and, and have a fairly good chance of not contracting the disease. As long as you follow all personal protective equipment protocols of, of proper donning and doffing and disinfection. And, and then it sounds like there's still a potential just because of how long this thing lingers. But um, God bless you all. Thank you if you're a responder out there serving on the front lines. If you are a provider, and you're overworked and, and ill-prepared and you're still serving the most vulnerable, thank you. God bless you. Thank you for your sacrifice for others. Uh, truly the greatest sign of love there is. Be well. We're going to get through this. We will all talk about it one day. We will all have learned from it. Let this crisis help us to become better. 
to be better prepared, but to become better people, more conscientious about life, uh, helping others. And until next time, keep on rescuing. Talk to you soon.